lot of videos on my channel talking about how on early Earth, for billions of years, life remained just single-celled, tiny microbial life, until finally multicellular animals evolved, which eventually led to us. This begs the question, how? How did tiny life become huge life? What prevented huge life on early Earth, and what finally allowed the evolution and diversification of more large, multicellular, complex life. So just for some quick background and what was going on on early Earth, well, we say early Earth, but really it was like majority of Earth's history was just microbial single-celled life. So we can see here on this timeline that single-celled microbial life dominated Earth from nearly three to four billion years, depending on when life first evolved on Earth, until around 600 million years ago when multicellular animal life evolved. Now, in this video, I'm gonna focus on multicellular animal life in terms of huge life, uh, but multicellularity has evolved more than once, many times actually, and I'll talk in a future video, or I'm planning to talk in a future video about all the times multicellularity has evolved, but um, note in this video I'm talking about the initial evolution and diversification of multicellular animals around 600 million years ago. So how did life go from single-celled organisms to organisms having millions to trillions of cells, like ourselves? Well, there's a clue in this slide because I show on the timeline that when it was just single-celled life, there was negligible to low oxygen levels, whereas once oxygen levels rose to a certain level, animal evolution and diversification or radiation occurred. I listed these trends in oxygen because it's thought that molecular oxygen, O2, the thing that we breathe today and all other animals use to respire oxygen and metabolize and gain energy, it's thought that this molecular oxygen was much lower in concentration on earlier Earth or before about 2.4 billion years ago when it initially rose to a certain level and then it had another major rise in a second oxygenation event that rose it to even higher levels, which is the oxygen rise event that led to or potentially led to allowing animals to evolve and diversify. And I actually talk about oxygen potentially being the reason for animal evolution and diversification in my Did Oxygen Cause Animal Evolution video? I can't remember what it's titled, something like that. I'll link it to the top right if you want to check it out. But you might be wondering why? Why would low oxygen levels prevent animals from evolving? The short answer is energy, and this is going to be what I'll talk about in this video. Why oxygen respiration, specifically, the metabolic pathway that all animals use, well, I shouldn't say all animals, I think there's like a small subset that might be able to anaerobically metabolize, but in any case, most animals use oxygen respiration. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about why oxygen respiration is so energetically beneficial compared to other metabolic pathways. Yes, there are other ways that life gains energy that don't involve oxygen. Life that does respire oxygen produces more energy than life that uses other compounds to metabolize. But before we jump right into the energy production of different metabolisms, let's take a step back and answer the question of what is metabolism? In simple language, it's life-sustaining reactions carried out by an organism. The three main functions of metabolism include conversion of food to energy, which in biology's case, energy is ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which I'll talk about in a second. The second major function is the conversion of food to proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates, which are other biomolecules that are used for all sorts of cell functions, and the elimination of wastes. Now, ultimately, metabolism involves a bunch of really complex molecules and electron transport chain and proton gradients across a membrane, which, you know, is all well and good, but simplified, it really just involves this diagram over here to the right. So ATP is the energy molecule of life, adenosine triphosphate. It's called triphosphate because it has three phosphate groups, which are represented by these three circles here on this diagram. Now the bond between the second and third phosphate group in that molecule stores a lot of energy. 
So when we break the bond, we produce energy, and this breaking of bonds and production of energy is called catabolism, and then we are left with ADP, adenosine diphosphate, which we can then add a phosphate group onto again in what's called anabolism, or making bonds, which we use energy for. So this production and use of energy by cycling adenosine triphosphate and adenosine diphosphate is kind of how we use and produce energy in our cells. And I'll talk a little bit more about metabolism on a later slide, but that's essentially all you need to know at the moment. There are diverse ways in which organisms produce ATP or produce energy and metabolize. Big life, like animals and plants, metabolize by either oxygen respiration, like ourselves, we take up molecular oxygen, we use it to oxidize oxidize organic carbon, like glucose, and then that organic carbon becomes oxidized to carbon dioxide, which we release by breathing out. It's much more complex than that, but simplified, that's the gist. And photosynthesis is kind of the equal opposite process, where plants take up carbon dioxide and water and use light energy to convert the carbon dioxide to organic carbon and convert the oxygen in the water into molecular oxygen. But many microbes use different metabolic pathways that result in lower energy yields than these other two pathways. These lower energy yields of these metabolic pathways are due to lower differences in redox potential of the molecules that they use in their metabolism. So let's back up a second. Before I define what redox potential is, let's talk a little bit about redox and what redox is and why it's so important. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about electrons here, but it's very simple, so don't click off the video. It's, it's going to come all back around to how tiny life got big, and it's going to be really cool, I promise. Don't leave. So redox just refers to reduction and oxidation chemical reactions. Reduction and oxidation reactions are just chemical reactions that involve the transfer of electrons. Reduction is the gaining of electrons because you're reducing the charge of that molecule by adding more electrons, which are negatively charged. And oxidation is the losing of electrons, becoming more oxidized. In other words, less negatively charged. Life harnesses the energy that is produced through the transfer of electrons. And then it uses that energy to create a hydrogen ion or a proton gradient across its cell membrane. This drives ATP production. So ultimately, in English, the electron transport chain is a series of redox reactions that transfer electrons from one molecule to another, which drives the pumping of protons outside the cell membrane, which causes a proton gradient across the cell membrane where there's more out than in, and then they all can be pumped back in the enzyme in the cell membrane that's called ATP synthase. It's called ATP synthase because it synthesizes ATP, the pumping of the protons back into the cell using ATP synthase is what produces ATP. You know, again, there's more complicated things involved. I have to use this disclaimer because people will comment and be like, it's not that simple. It's not that simple, but in simplified terms, that's how cells make ATP and energy. It all starts with redox. So because there's so many different metabolic pathways using different redox reactions, electron transferring reactions, we have made this tower called the redox tower that shows the diversity of metabolic pathways or really just redox reactions in order on this, you know, nicely laid out tower. The first thing you might notice about this tower is that, wow, there's a lot of pathways or metabolisms that don't involve oxygen at all. Many organisms use other compounds rather than oxygen for their internal redox reactions, which eventually allow them to gain energy. These microbes that metabolize without the use of molecular oxygen are called anaerobes. We are aerobes. We use oxygen. We use what's called aerobic respiration. But how does one read this tower? It's got reactions on the left, reactions on the right. Where am I supposed to look and what does it mean? Well, the reactions on the left are oxidation reactions. Reactions in which the compound on the left side of the arrow undergoes a reaction of oxidation in which it loses electrons to become the oxidized compound on the right side of the arrow. Whereas reactions on the right side of the tower are reduction reactions where the compound gains electrons to become more negatively charged. But the labels that I've put here on the different metabolic 
reactions or metabolic pathways only point to half the equation. Each oxidation reaction must be coupled with a reduction reaction and vice versa. In other words, each reduction reaction can only take place if there is a coinciding oxidation reaction occurring. Because say we look here at the top of the redox tower when we see the oxidation of organic carbon to CO2. Something would have had to cause that organic carbon to become oxidized. Something would have had to take the electrons from that organic carbon in order for it to become oxidized to CO2. The thing that does that in our case is molecular oxygen. So you can see we have one left reaction or oxidation reaction on the tower coupled a reaction on the right side of the tower, a reduction reaction. This is why they're called redox. Another example of a reduction in oxidation pathway that leads to a metabolic pathway is photosynthesis, where instead of organic carbon being the reductant or the thing causing the reduction of the other compound, it's water. And instead of oxygen being the oxidant or the thing causing the oxidation of the other compound, it's CO2. To give an example outside of our normal, outside of photosynthesis and aerobic respiration, we have sulfate reduction which can occur using either the organic carbon to CO2 oxidation reaction or the methane to CO2 oxidation reaction. In either case, sulfate is the equivalent of oxygen in our case. It's the thing accepting electrons. It is the oxidant. It causes the oxidation of the other compound, whereas organic carbon, same as us, could be the reductant or methane could be. But to understand how this is significant for energy yields and why different metabolic pathways have different energy yields, we have to now look at the order of the redox tower. Why are they listed in this order? Are they always listed in this order? What's the significance of the order? The redox tower orders the reactions by reduction potential. Reduction potential, or this weird E symbol, is the tendency of a chemical species or compound to become reduced. The greater the difference in reduction potential between your oxidation reaction and your reduction reaction that you use in your metabolism, the greater the energy yield you get from that metabolism. Because oxygen respiration involves a reaction way down here on the redox tower and the very, very top reaction on the redox tower, the difference between those two things is so huge that it allows the greatest yield of energy. When we look at this in terms of voltage, we see that the difference between the reduction potential of the reduction reaction and the oxidation reaction involved in our metabolism, in other words, the oxygen reduction and the organic carbon oxidation reaction, we see that we get a 1.25 voltage difference. Whereas with sulfate reaction, because there's less difference in reduction potential between the sulfate reduction reaction and the organic carbon oxidation reaction, we see that it's only a 0.26 voltage difference, and that yields less overall energy from that metabolism. In other words, they produce less ATP, the microbes that use sulfate reduction as their metabolic pathway. Even less energy is produced when sulfate reducers use the methane oxidation pathway rather than the organic carbon glucose-like molecule oxidation pathway. Greater E values, greater reduction potential values, lead to overall greater energy production because it all comes back to thermodynamics. Now, again, I'm going to say it again. Don't leave the video. I'm going to bring it back to very simple, you know, overarching, bringing everything back together terms at the end here. But here, I just want to briefly cover some basic thermodynamics that I know you guys all remember and are fine with, and that is Gibbs free energy. I'm not going to get into the weeds of this, but basically the change in G or Gibbs free energy determines whether a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. In other words, whether it will occur spontaneously or whether it will require energy to occur. Reactions in which the change in Gibbs free energy is less than zero, negative, are spontaneous, are exothermic, release energy, and occur spontaneously. Whereas those with greater than or equal to zero changes in Gibbs free energy require energy and do not occur spontaneously. 
So how does E have to do with G? In other words, reduction potential with Gibbs free energy? Well, they're related by this equation that basically shows that the larger the E, or reduction potential, the larger or more negative the change in Gibbs free energy, and thus the more energetically favorable, the more thermodynamically favorable the reaction is, and the more energy you'll get out of it. However, even when change in Gibbs free energy is negative, there's sometimes an energy barrier or an activation energy that the reaction has to overcome before it can occur, even if the end product of the reaction is more stable or more favorable. And in life, enzymes really help to lower such activation energies or energy barriers so that life can do more reactions and do them at a much faster rate. That's why using the energy produced by metabolism to produce enzymes, for example, is really important for life. So what does any of this have to do with geo or geology? I get a lot of comments sometimes on my more bio-focused videos saying, Geo girl is really more bio girl, but I am a geoscientist and the reason that I learned about the redox tower was purely for geoscience, was for the science of rocks and how sedimentation works and why there's different compositions in ocean sedimentation, for example, at different depths. And spoiler alert, it's largely controlled by redox processes. This is because the dominant redox reaction or the dominant metabolic pathway of the life that lives in that region changes drastically with depth. Therefore, the sediment produced at any particular depth is dependent on the redox reactions occurring there. If it's a ferruginous zone, you're going to get iron-rich sediment. If it's a sulfitic zone, you're going to get sulfide-rich sediment, and so on. But why are the redox zones listed in this order? Is this order specific for some reason? Are they always in this order and why? Well, let's compare it to the order of the redox tower to see if we see any patterns. The first zone of redox reactions in depths of water columns or sediment columns is the oxic zone. This is where mostly oxic or aerobic respiration is occurring, the use of oxygen to metabolize. And below that we have the nitrate reduction zone, followed by the manganese reduction zone, then the iron reduction zone. Do you see a pattern emerging? Then the sulfate reduction zone, and can you predict the last one, the methanogenesis zone. So yeah, these zones are going up the redox tower. In other words, the first or surface redox zone is always oxic or aerobic respiration because that's the most energetically favorable way to decompose organic carbon that's being produced by phytoplankton at the ocean surface and thus kind of the first line of defense or the first line of decomposition below whatever bloom is at the surface to decompose that organic carbon, oxidize it and produce carbon dioxide and kind of continue that cycle. And then the second most energetically favorable is nitrate reduction, and then manganese, and then iron, and then sulfate reduction, and then methanogenesis, or the production of methane by reducing carbon dioxide. The general theme for modern oceans and lakes, especially their water columns, is a very thick oxic zone. Because on modern Earth, oceans and lakes are really typically well oxygenated, and there's a lot of oxygen on modern Earth. So in this modern Earth scenario, redox stratification, or these layers of redox zones, is typically restricted to only the sediment column where oxygen can sometimes become depleted enough to allow these other zones to kind of take over. But on early Earth, before oxygen levels rose, when oxygen concentrations on Earth were relatively low to negligible, water columns were also redox stratified with nitrogenous, manganous, ferruginous, sulfitic, and methanic zones. But keep in mind, these zones on early, pre-oxygenated Earth were very different than that of today. The lack of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere led to a lack of weathering, oxidative continental weathering, and thus the lack of transport of oxidized compounds like sulfate and molybdate to the oceans. Why is this important? Well, less available sulfate would have led to less sulfate reduction and thus a smaller sulfitic zone in early Earth oceans, potentially. 
also less molybdate, although molybdenum doesn't have its own, you know, metabolic pathway and zone, it does strongly control on early Earth, potentially it strongly limited that of the nitrogenous zone because molybdate is required for organisms that fix or reduce atmospheric nitrogen into other nitrogen compounds, kind of kicking off the nitrogen cycle. The reason is because molybdenum is used in the production of the enzyme that carries out this nitrogen fixation reaction. A lack of oxygen on early Earth may have had the opposite effect on the manganese and viriginous zones, in fact, increasing their spread since these ions would have been more soluble in water that contained less oxygen. Likewise, methanogens would have also probably had a larger methanic zone during early Earth low oxygen times, because on early Earth, there were really CO2 rich atmospheres and oceans, leading to a lot of methanogenesis because it uses CO2 in that process. Throughout Earth's history, each of these zones has kind of had its moment. We think that before the first major rise in oxygen concentrations around 2.4 billion years ago, the oceans may have been mainly ferruginous, and then during the period in between the first and second major oxygenation events, which is also nicknamed the Boring Billion, the oceans were probably a mixture of sulfitic, oxic, and ferruginous, and, you know, some other minor zones in between those, and then after about 700, 600 million years ago, we've had largely oxic oceans and other water bodies, which has continued to today. We know this and we reconstruct or study Earth's past and the dominance of these different zones in Earth's past by using things called proxies or signatures in the rock record that can tell us about past conditions on Earth. And I talk about this and how we use proxies and physical versus chemical versus biological proxies, all about all of that in my how we know what happened video or how we study Earth's past video, which I'll link to the top right if you're interested. From this information about Earth's past and the redox zones present in Earth's past, we can get an idea, well, that and fossils, we can get an idea of kind of early microbial evolution on early Earth and throughout Earth's history. But why do we care? Why do we care about what microbes were first around on Earth and how they evolved into oxygen respiring microbes and how long that took? And, you know, why do we care about the evolutionary history and the chemical history of Earth's oceans and atmospheres? Well, one major reason is because currently ocean oxygen concentrations are decreasing due to increasing primary productivity levels, in other words, phytoplankton, algal, and bacterial blooms at ocean surface, which are driving oxygen depletion beneath them in the water column beneath them because that increases the decomposition and thus the oxygen use in that water below them. And the reason primary productivity is increasing is because of the increasing CO2 levels in the atmosphere and an increase in nutrient runoff, in other words, human activity. I recently made a video about ocean fertilization, which I'll link up to the top right, if you're curious to learn more about this process and how it might actually help us combat climate change in the long run. Ultimately, however, the ocean anoxia, or the lack of oxygen or depletion of oxygen concentrations in the ocean caused by this reaction, this process, is cause for concern or at least study about what effects that might have on other life in the ocean and redox zones and how they might spread or distribute themselves due to such depletion of oxygen and for that studying how these zones have fluctuated in distribution in the past is really important. But how does all this relate back to how life got big? Ultimately, the topic of this video is how tiny life, single-celled organisms became so freaking huge. Well, if we look back at the oxygen levels throughout Earth's history that I showed at the beginning of the video, we see that the first oxygen rise, the Great Oxidation Event around 2.4 billion years ago, is subsequently followed by the evolution of eukaryotes. Eukaryotes, as opposed to prokaryotes, are just the type of cell that animals evolved from. They're a bit more complex, they contain organelles, other things in their cells, and, you know, they evolved multicellularity. Eukaryotes eventually diversified into animals, plants, fungi, 
etc. Prokaryotes, on the other hand, include things like bacteria and archaea, very simple single-celled organisms. The second major oxygen rise around 600, 700 million years ago in the Neoproterozoic oxygenation event is directly followed by the evolution and diversification of multicellular animals, large, complex organisms. So it's pretty clear that oxygen played a role. And it's probably because the higher energy yields of oxygen respiration allows, you know, more energy to be used for multicellularity, for cells in bodies with different functions that have specialized functions that make enzymes, that make proteins, that make whatever, make organelles or whatever it might be. And so the energy produced by oxygen respiration allows multicellularity in a way that the energy yields of other metabolisms just don't seem to. All animals from sponges to elephants to humans respire oxygen. The only other organisms on Earth that get as big as animals are plants which photosynthesize, again using a metabolism with very large redox potential difference, if we remember the redox tower, and fungi, which can get pretty large as well, but most of the very large fungi, although many metabolize in diverse ways, the large ones typically are ones that use aerobic respiration or oxygen respiration. But if oxygen was the key for multicellularity, why was there such a long pause between eukaryote evolution, in other words, the evolution of things that respired oxygen, and multicellularity, at least in animals? There's some ideas that the first eukaryotes may have been anaerobic, but it's still thought that aerobic oxygen and respiration evolved long before multicellular animals, so why? One idea suggests that it was Snowball Earth that triggered this multicellularity after the second major oxygen rise in Earth's history. I talk about how Snowball Earth might have led to multicellularity in a couple videos. My Snowball Earth video is one, and then also a recent short I did. I'll link one of those up there. But another idea is that the evolution of oxygen respiration and then the subsequent evolution of multicellularity using oxygen respiration may have just been limited by evolutionary chance. Of course, we're talking about these things that allowed or caused the evolution of whatever, but ultimately evolution comes down to chance. It comes down to the chance of some gene getting passed down and this thing happening and this thing surviving and this thing reproducing, etc. And that involves a lot of time before something happens that causes multicellularity and evolution by random chance. So, well, it's not random chance. It's like fitness, you know, of course, natural selection. And this is also involved in the Snowball Earth hypothesis, that is, the multicellular life was more fit to survive those conditions, but ultimately, you know, it takes time for chance mutations and genetic things to get passed down that are more fit per se. But in any case, if you want to know more about how oxygen was really important or the rise of oxygen was really important for animal evolution, I suggest you check out my how oxygen might have caused animal evolution video, which I'll link up here for you. With that, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and my references are linked down below as always, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!